Welcome to The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction, in which we look at the greatest and holiest writers from Catholic history. Join us as we explore the life and times in which they lived, an overview and study of their greatest works, and how we as Catholics can look to these masters as models for our own holiness on our journey to heaven. All right, welcome back for another episode on this uh, Spiritual Masters um, with our focus on the great doctor of the church, the doctor of grace, St. Augustine of Hippo. And uh, we continue with my dear friend, Dr. Paul Thigpen. Thank you again for being here with us, Dr. Thigpen. It's a delight, Connor. Thank you for having me. Let's uh, let's begin this time with uh, a short prayer seeking uh, Augustine's intercession into this conversation in our lives. Would you lead us, please? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. St. Augustine, Doctor of Grace, pray with us now and for us that God's grace will be abundant in this conversation, that we'll have the grace to discern and also the, the grace to, to act on what we learn. We thank you for your life of holiness, your pursuit of the truth. We ask that we could imitate you. Father, we ask all these things in the name of your Son. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, Paul. Why does the book uh, Confessions matter to you so much? This is this matters to a lot of people, but just give us your own personal experience. What's the big deal about this book? When I read this book, I, I read my own story in so many ways. I mean, not to compare myself in any way to St. Augustine, but <clears throat> he he was really the only ancient writer like this to look so closely at the movements of the soul interior things whether it's memory or imagination or sense of guilt or moral behavior and um i like to call him a a doctor of the soul you know teacher Mm. of the soul he really understood the soul to this day you have psychologists who study this path these passages in here because they officer so much uh, abundant material to talk about. Augustine was the first <laughs> psychologist. And I think in certain ways you could say that. Yeah. And he did it by looking at himself. I mean, he does have some psychology of Monica in there too, and, and uh, Ambrose maybe, but <clears throat> he did it by, by looking at himself. And because he was so honest and humble enough to, I mean, here he's a bishop, to lay out his life, including all the bad stuff. He laid it out for people to read uh, and for people to talk about. Uh, because he thought it would it would help them to understand that, and here we are, all these centuries later, reading it and seeing ourselves. It's it's like a mirror sometimes, seeing ourselves in his his confessions. So, what about the kind of the historical context of this? You know, where was he in his life when he wrote this? He was not an old man yet. So, talk to us about that. I I read he was forty three, which is my age. That's right. That's, so, that's not an old man. I don't know. <laughs> it's not yet. <laughs> no, right? not 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 in my book. That's no. for sure. Well, again, he he was bishop at the time. A so, fairly new bishop, a couple of years maybe. I don't know. A few years after. Let's see. Look at the timeline here. No, well, he's, he's at least started writing about the uh, about four hundred, and it was what three ninety six, I guess. Yeah, so he became bishop of Hippo, just a handful so of years. Just a few years. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> but already of great reputation. He's yes. already kind of a celebrity, I guess. I mean, he had a reputation before he even became became Christian when he was was a because of his, his rhetoric. He was such a preacher. Um, so amazing thing that he would open up his life and be transparent and vulnerable. He made himself vulnerable to use the, the modern terms to for the sake of of his flock. That some way maybe you can be encouraged by my struggles and be encouraged that that I'm making it. It seems to be. But I still have struggles, and I understand your struggles. So what a, what a beautiful thing to do. And, and it, it came at a price. I mean, it, there would have been people who would have made all kinds of hay <laughs> out of this. <clears throat> Did you hear what the bishop said about himself? Or Especially his, his enemies, uh, the Pelagians and others. Yeah, we'll t- just yeah touch on that because the Pelagians <laughs> were really stuck up, and they would have been scandalized about him, you know, confessing these things out loud. So... You know, just kind of touch on why would that be so scan? I mean, scandalous today. I mean, people don't like to air their dirty laundry, but particularly back then. Well, they, you know, they had a a, a political, theological, political uh, axe to grind, and so anything they said that 
and, and he was their most formidable opponent. Anything that he said that would give them ammunition would was a good thing. And also, um, well, the Pelagians, the Pelagians, that the the core of their belief, though, or uh, actually more the Donatists. Well, I was going to say the Donatists, Donatists probably Donatists. more because they yeah. were the ones that the Puritans of their day. They're Puritans. Say. They basically believed that if you were if you had committed certain kinds of sins, then your sacraments weren't valid, mm -hmm. and that a priest could not confer the sacraments. And there were certain people that, for instance, if you committed apostasy, you could not even be forgiven. A lot of them believed that and yeah. brought back into the church. Yeah. So, so, so for him being a prominent bishop and confessing these things, mm -hmm. these Puritans, for lack of a better word, they, they were scandalized. And but to get back to the Pelagians, they they claimed that. Uh, they looked in the confessions and saw indications that he was really still Manichaean in certain mm. ways. We talked in the last episode about the Manichae, Manichaeans, and uh, because he he talked so much about brokenness, mm. and the Manichaeans said that you know uh, there's a god of evil in this whole realm of, of pure evil, and and it's trapped us and all these things, and it was a way to try to explain how evil is in the world. And so anyway, his enemies would do take different tacks with it, but oh, he's not not to be respected at all because he has this past or he still struggles with things or to say, oh, yeah, you listen to him. He's, he's still Manichaean. Wow. Yeah. And they probably knew that he'd be open to all those things. But still he wrote it. And still we have this gift today, centuries later, where we can read this book and, and say, oh, my goodness, that's my story. The book's had many editions, many translations through the mm -hmm. years, probably in every language imaginable. And I have to note that in a, uh, we're, we're recording this in February of 2023, and in a few more months, uh, we're going to have our own translation t at Tan Books. We're going to have our own translation of the Augustine's Confessions by Dr. Anthony Eslin, uh, who you know, know of, and 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 uh, he's just a, a masterful translator. He did all of Dante, um, the Divine Comedy. So I wish we had that now to read some passages, but it's uh, still in manuscript form. But I'm hoping that that will be a tremendous addition to add to the the long lineage of many good additions. So. If if someone had asked me, you know, before I knew about that he was doing it, uh, if you could grab one living person to do a new translation of the Confessions, what well, who would it be? It would have been Tony. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for saying that because I, I'm so excited. I called him or. We called him as a team and said, so I know you like to translate, you know, uh, how would you like to do the confessions? And he said, he said, that sounds awesome. Let me think about it. And very quickly, he's like, yep, I'll do it. So we're, we're very, very excited. I just can't, can't wait to, to read it. It's going to be beautiful. I mean, you have Augustine who just wrote beautifully, but if your translation's not right, you can butcher it. Yeah. So Tony will nail it. He certainly will. All right. Um, so here at TAN, we're trying to add to that, you know, to that great history of yeah. great translations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, this book really gives a, a, a very good um, overview of his early life. A couple key points that I thought we'd kind of touch on. I sent some interesting things, and I'm trying not to be too redundant about the timeline that we covered in the last episode, because we don't want to repeat everything. But let's, let's zoom in on a few key points that reveal what Augustine's really trying to discover about himself and about his human nature. It was just always the struggle for him to understand what is this human nature that we have. And I, it, it begins, well, actually, let's begin by saying how the book actually begins, which is the, the great famous quote that we finished last uh, episode with. So just go through that because I think that's the very beginning of the work. Mm -hmm. I did, this is not a commercial because it's out of print, but I did a book before, Restless Till We Rest in You. It was Reflections from St. Augustine. And I chose that title because on the very first page of the Confessions, he says, uh, you know, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. Almost choked up. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And you, he returns to that theme again and again, of seeking rest. He, he uh, and again, in other books too, City of God and all, how the great Sabbath, the, the 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 consummation of all things that we read about in the book of revelation it will be the great rest mm. the great rest and uh, and so I, I think it it tells us so much about the book it tells us so much about the man that his his whole life was spent seeking the truth and in doing so seeking god 
and uh, and, he, and he was restless in, his, in the way he did it. He would, you get it in the confessions. He'll he'll see a lizard basking in the sun, and immediately his mind will turn to okay, what what's a spiritual, spiritual illustration that comes out of that? Or he'll hear the <clears throat> the women in the harvest who are harvesting a great crop there in North Africa, and they have this kind of ubalic trill that they do that's it goes beyond words, and it's, but it's just this great celebratory thing. And he, he sees that as, as almost like uh, some people have been said, like speaking in tongues or something, but a praise that just goes beyond earth because we're so exalted up to heaven with it. And wherever he turned, he was restless to find God in that moment, God in that situation. What lesson can I learn about God? He's looking for traces of God in the creation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, early in the confessions, he finds it, uh, he, he asks questions and, and finds these difficult celestial questions uh, even an infant nursing on his mother you know <laughs> yes. you know i've had plenty of kids passage. so it's, it's so he has a i'm just gonna well to explain why why would he even bring that up what was the point of that you well know? he said you know even when we're babies we're selfish <laughs> real <laughs> selfish not, it's basically you know original sin or yeah. whatever our concupiscence already and um and he talks about how our children will be even little children that they they want their way, and they'll pitch a fit. You know, it's almost it's, violent. Yeah, you know? oh, violent. Yeah, yeah. and the struggle. And it, <laughs> I can't remember exactly how I said it, but he says basically, uh, yeah. They're people say, well, they're harmless. He says, well, they're only harmless because they're not as strong as adults are. <laughs> but with their attitude and their desires and their passions, if they were strong as we are, they'd really be trouble. They'd be beating us all up right. because they are selfish in that way. Right, and then he. Had, uh, it says in, you know, in particular that if you have two children at the breast and one sees the other one is drinking, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether the other one's hungry or not. This is my place. I know. You exactly. Get out of here. <laughs> you know, we had twins five years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, I, saw, I saw it firsthand. These little guys, you know, well before the age of reason, right. you know, they were getting very territorial, you know, yep. yeah. in lots of ways, you know. But yeah. it's just, again, that shows the spirit of Augustine, he is seeing the mm -hmm. moral dilemma, the human mm -hmm. nature, the presence of God, the lack of God and, you know, and sin and vice. And he sees it everywhere, everywhere. And so it's just a, a stroke of brilliance to kind of begin the book by talking about infants. You know? <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. He's confessing I was an infant and a selfish infant. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought to do that? You know? <laughs> But to, and to use it as a point, and we're all this way. We're all this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that kind of leads into his adolescence, about 12 years old. And there's a famous scene <laughs> um, that gets, you know, again, it's a, it's kind of, it looks like a little harmless incident in every boy's little life. Mm -hmm. But he's able to extrapolate tremendous theological insight from it. So tell us that story. <laughs> so he's out playing with some buddies. And he, and he makes the comment, we were probably out much too late. And being that late, the, the adults weren't watching. And so somebody gets the idea, hey, the, this neighbor over here has a pear tree and it's full of fruit. And he makes the point of saying, the fruit wasn't that good. It wouldn't even taste it very good. I mean, I, I'd prefer some other fruit. But they all said, you know, let's play a trick on them, basically. And they all went and they shook the thing to get all the pears down and started pulling all the pears off the tree. And uh, I used to have a pear tree, and and I remember one time for myself, I was shaking it, and they just all started falling because they get so heavy. But anyway, they do this, and you know, he talks about his own inner life at that point, and how I'm not doing it because I wanted to eat the pears. In fact, we took the pears and fed them to the you know, beast, I don't know, pigs or something. We we threw it to them. We didn't want it for ourselves. The pleasure was in doing the wrong thing. Yeah, and um. And then he starts thinking about, you know, to take that to the next level. How, how often is that the case for us? Uh, we're, we're not even doing it because we're hungry, knowing that it's wrong because it's not ours. But we're doing it just because we take pleasure, not in the pair, but in the stealing of the pair. It's a staggering thought. Mm -hmm. and it, You know, and um, again, that's just a brilliant insight in that, that maybe what, how much of that is present when we as grown adults do sins, big sins, little sins, I mean, when is that present? But it's this, um, is it fair to say, Paul, that, that Augustine, he, he struggled with the, the problem of evil his entire life? I mean, he just mm. 
continually came back to it in one way or another, dealing with the heresies, dealing with his mm -hmm. own sermons, his, his different works. I mean, what is this thing in us or outside of us or both that is drawing us away from God? And it was just, you can just tell, I can just see the guy sitting in his room, just shaking his head saying, what is going on? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, even his experience with the Manichees, that's what one of the things that would have attracted them. They promised this explanation for that. And, and they, seeing that there is a dualistic presence in the universe and there was just this God of evil, at least he could stick his finger out exactly, and say, there so you that's go. That's what it is. Yeah, that's that's because we are trapped here in this world and have been trapped because there was an elaborate mythology that they had. Yeah. But we are trapped in this world. So that's that's where it comes from. That's the problem. So, I mean, that's the thing is like it just shows that um, his intellectual and his own spiritual struggle began very young. He must have been aware of it. But even as a 43-year-old man, a bishop, he's looking back at 12 years old. He's looking back at infancy and saying, this struggle, this struggle. <laughs> and that's, the, again, that's the other side of that restlessness, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. it's kind of it's kind of beautiful. Um, so what else about the confession? What are the themes, or do you think, or some passages that you might want to read? I mean, what um, we've talked about, it takes tremendous humility. It, uh, <clears throat> it It's about this internal struggle. We're not really going through the biography, but um, what other what other parts of the of the confessions would you would you uh, want to talk about? I think it's it's uh, important to to recognize why he called it the confession. Oh yeah, you know? of course. And uh, because today, when we think of confession, we think of confession of sin, you know, sacramental confession, or just confess, you know, fess up. Um, and that was certainly one of the, as we we're seeing, one of the the important themes there. But confession also meant, could mean a confession of faith. So even later on in the Middle Ages, um, you would, like the, the Lutherans had a, the Augsburg Confession, and mm -hmm. it was a creed, basically. But then also confession um, had this could have the sense of praise, saying to God how wonderful you are. So you're, you're kind of, you're, you're speaking, you're stating something with God. You're, you're agreeing with God about your sin. You're agreeing with God. Even like the, the word con is with, right. of course. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, and, and the word, the, the root word for fessio or whatever is, is something having to do with speak or deliver or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. So so you're speaking with, with God. We're speaking you're with agreeing. God. God says, it's wrong. And you say, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I went to confession not too long ago. And uh, the the priest made the comment that you know by the fact that you're in this little room on your knees just shows that you're agreeing with God mm -hmm, that you need to mm -hmm. be here. Mm -hmm. And I, it was an interest I had never really thought about it. Oh, we're in agreement. Okay, that's good. You know, that's that's a head, that's mm -hmm. a start. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a confession, and it's mm -hmm. kind of an interest. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a, a and and we'll often say profession of faith because you're speaking forth. That means you know declaring. But in the other sense of confession of of staying faith. Um, you also think about how you're you're agreeing with God about the truth, but you're also agreeing with the others, especially when you make a corporate confession of faith. That um, you're saying together, you're saying with each other, these things are true. And then finally, you know, when you you do it as an act of praise, you're saying to God, "Yes, you really are smart. You really are big. You really are loving. You're just. You're kind. You're all powerful." You're agreeing with God about who He is, and you think this is why He wrote the confessions to God. It's 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 everything that that was your unique uh, yeah, device. Yeah, yeah, that excuse me, that um, struck me when I first picked up the book because no one had warned me <laughs> it was going to be that way. That he's he's writing it in second person. He's not just writing first person. I did this. I did that. He's not writing about himself as if you know he's a third person. But the whole thing is it's a book length prayer yeah. because it's all said to God. Second, and he's consistent about it. Yeah, and so it it makes it makes very vivid, you know, his sense of the reality that God is right there with him, watching everything, observing, talking. Um, and it, it it did that for me to to help me think about how God is right there. He's it, right there. It enables you yeah. to kind of put his words into your own mind because as you're reading and you you're mm -hmm. seeing, you know, I praise you, Lord, or whatever it may be. I did this wrong. I did, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, you're, it's, it enables you to put it into, into your own mind and your own words. It helps you connect with it. But I can't think of many other uh, saints or scholars who have used this device 
And it might yeah. be because we're all yeah. scared to try it because he did <laughs> yeah. such a good job. We don't want to look like a third rate Augustine if we try it. You know? <laughs> no, I know. I was going to see if we can find it, this book that I had done. So this book that you wrote. This is the one that I wrote. It was basically. Daily had, Meditations. Well yeah, but, but drawn from his. Yeah. Let's see. Um, just some, some beautiful places where. But he he has one place where he just goes on and on, and he just does what I was doing a while ago. Just creates this this mountain of praise where he just keeps. It's like he keeps piling on, piling on. Oh, you're great. You're so good. You're merciful to us. You forgive us. And and all in the it all has an interior aspect to it where he's talking about this is what you've done for me and this is what you've done in me. But it's 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 a very powerful expression of praise it, it reminds you of the psalms which mm. he loved dearly and he he wrote about all the psalms he had commentaries on all the psalms and you know one of the th speaking about that mounting of praise as he just keeps building and building it and building it you know he said somewhere and i have the quote buried in here somewhere but he makes the comment that he's always he feels the truth and beauty in in his heart so so strongly and he's always dis disappointed when it comes out of his mouth. <laughs> yes, you know, that's like, right. Why can, and this. he says, why cannot my lips do justice to my heart? You know, <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing to think that because, you know, he was, he was uh, so articulate and so beautiful in his speech. But he always feels uh, let down when he, when he speaks and writes. And as somewhat of a writer myself, I... I can I can relate that you know you're the, one of the reasons I like writing more than speaking is you can polish and edit that's and polish right. and edit that's right because you have this as a melancholic I have the <laughs> sense that I never quite said it right and I second guess speaking of melancholic I'm reading his uh, his biography the other mm -hmm. night and uh, my wife who's an extremely choleric uh, temperament and I'm very melancholic and I read a part in here where uh, a quote from a from Augustine that says, I was, I'm, I was just looking for sad things to read. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. reading sad things. <laughs> and I read this to my wife and she went, oh, he's such a melancholic. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, but it's, he, he was, and that, but that enabled him to feel deeply. He was a, he was a, and I think the confessions, particularly that amongst all his works, mm -hmm. Paul, it shows mm -hmm. that he felt even more deeply than he thought. Oh, passionate about God. I love how he's passionate about his friendships. You read some of his descriptions. He says, you know, close friend, we we were like one soul in two bodies. Mm. And and when he has a friend die and he and he just, you know, he grieves so deeply. He says, I don't even want to be in the places where we used to be together. I can't stand that. Mm. And and I keep thinking that I I just want to die myself. But then he says, but but no, because we really were kind of like one soul and two bodies, I, I didn't want to die because then it would mean the rest of who he was would be gone too. Mm. And it, all these just beautiful things, he just is like that. But let me, yeah, let me give an example please, here. Please do. I did, did find one of the ones. Uh, and, and a lot of folks will recognize the words. <clears throat> he says to God in the confessions, I hope we can read it without chipping up. Too late have I come to love you. Beauty. So ancient, so new. Yes, too late have I come to love you. You were within. I'm sorry, I can't. I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you if you my want. My own conversion. <laughs> you were within me, yet I was looking for you outside myself. I, in my ugliness, rushed headlong into the things of beauty you had made. That was, he's loving the things, the beautiful things more than the, the one who made them. You were with me, Lord. What a great line. You were with me. But I was not with you. The things you had created kept me far from you. Yet if they had not been in you, they would not have been at all. You called to me. You cried aloud. And you broke through my deafness. You flashed and shone and chased away my blindness. You breathed upon me fragrantly. I drew in my breath, and now I pant for you. I tasted, and now I hunger and thirst for you. You touched me, and I burned to enjoy your peace. 
Why does it mean so much to you, Paul? It's my story. That's your story? It's my story. Thank you. Yeah. I should have had a... I should have had it closer by if we were going into the confessions, you know. I should have known. <laughs> I should have known. Yeah, well, that's that. That, story. Uh, that that language is packed so full <clears throat> with meaning. I mean, it's such beauty. I mean, it's, it's, it's analogies, his imagery, it's all. But if you recognize it as your own, you just you can't read it without tears. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's well, amazing? Um, that that's the pro, that's a perfect passage to show this passion of this mm-hmm. man mm-hmm. and the doctor, the doctor of grace. It could be the doctor of passion. It could be the doctor <laughs> yeah. of many things. Yeah. Um, but thank you for sharing that mm-hmm. and sharing the emotion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 very powerful. Let's move now to um, the third. I'm sorry, the last three books of the confession, and it's it was interesting to me that. We go from this extraordinarily passionate appeal and description of his life and the the pair and his conversion. And he talks, of, of course, well, which we talked about in the last episode, but his baptism, the, the moments of conversion when uh, he hears about the life of St. Anthony and then he hears the child calling to him to pick up, take it up and read. And he finds the passage from St. Paul and the death of his mother and just all this in- incredible stuff. But at the uh, at the last three chapters or books of this of this work, he turns to Genesis and he starts doing some biblical commentary. It seems out of place, but it's probably not. So why do you think he finishes his autobiography <laughs> at the age of forty three as a fairly new bishop? The last three parts of the of the work are on the book of Genesis. Why? I think it's, at least in one sense, it's his confession of praise. That Because what he does with it is to draw out from these first chapters of Genesis, the creation. And, um, and that means talking about who the creator is and how he's all-powerful. He does it out of nothing. And he uh, not just is powerful to make these things, but, but as he said in the passage I read, you, you're the beauty so ancient and so new. You, you look at creation and what he's made, it's so beautiful because he's beautiful. The one who made it is beautiful. It's, it's reflecting his own beauty. So it shows his power, his beauty, but also shows his wisdom. And so by looking at the early chapters of Genesis, it's kind of a, almost like a confession of faith, finally saying, first of all, this is, this is God. This is all about God. And, but then, because it's those early chapters, you also get to the fall. And... That allows him to start talking about this thing that we're talking about, sin, and grace, and how our story begins there. And as, as a human race, it begins there. But for each of us, it kind of begins there, too, because of original sin. And so, um, so it gives him the opportunity, I think, to, to lay out kind of so many principal truths of the Christian faith. And... But it also reflects just how important the scripture was to him. He had, he had written off to St. Jerome, please give me your translations of, yeah. of scripture. And studying them, and, and you look at his, not just these books, but, but his homilies, he's just tossing scripture references off all the time. And certainly would have agreed with the, the famous statement of St. Jerome, ignorance of the scripture is ignorance of Christ. Yes. So he sees Christ the word in these words. And so it, even though some folks have you know, complained that it seems to lack unity, the book does, because you've got this last part like that, I think it's, it just shows us Augustine. It shows where his heart is. It shows us where his, his mind is. These are important things, and they touch on all the kinds of themes that we've been discussing. You know what I think it is? Whether it, whether it was intentional or, <coughs> or, or not intentional but providential, it, it was a foreshadowing of his new life, you know, the, the mm-hmm. new Augustine. Mm-hmm. And most of that book was kind of the old Augustine. But now it's saying, I sought wisdom. I sought even even pleasure in all ways, in all Manichaeism and Neoplatonism and all these different places in Cicero and Virgil and wherever. Now I'm going to seek it in Holy Scripture. And for an academic to admit that, 
uh, is quite something. Mm. Um, and so for him to say, <coughs> yep, my autobiography at the age of 43, it finished it up with showing that I'm dedicating my life to understanding Scripture. And that's ultimately what he did. I mean, he was mm. just one of the greatest biblical scholars. But again, I just want to really drive the point home for a philosopher mm. to to admit <laughs> it's just in understanding what God is saying through Scripture. That's where true wisdom is found. That's a great act of humility, and I think he's showing us that this is what he's going to do for the rest of his life. I think it's a foreshadowing. It's it illustrates what centuries later St. Thomas will say, you know, is that um, even though the faith is reasonable, there's a lot that we can't get to by reason. It had to come by revelation. And he gives the reasons. It's in the beginning of his Summa. gives various reasons for why God had to also reveal truth. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, for, for starters, he says, well, you know, it could take a Plato to figure out some of these things, and we're not all Plato. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also things that, like the inner life of God, the inner nature of God, the, the Trinity, you can't get there by reason. But that doesn't mean it's, it's not true or it's unreasonable. Yeah. It has to be revealed. And it's revealed, in, first of all, in Christ's coming, but then in the Scripture that points to Christ. It's a beautiful work. Mm -hmm. um, closing comments, uh, I'll give you the last word on what makes <laughs> the August Augustine's Confession so powerful. The next, the next uh, episode, we're going to talk about the City of God, which is a very different kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, but closing comments on the Confessions. I would just call him a, a doctor of the soul, not just a doctor of grace, but a doctor of the soul. Doctor in the old sense of the word that means teacher from the Latin. And um, and and people have recognized that, even people who don't agree with him on so much. Even – it's amazing. Calvin and Luther just were great Augustinians in certain ways. They didn't take it all the way. But um, modern psychologists, modern philosophers, it's such a rich garden. To, to go digging in and find all different kinds of fruits, nuts, and other things. And um, I would I would just encourage our listeners to read the book. Read the book. Even if you get to a place where he starts talking about time and eternity and he's like, oh, it's a little above me, my pay grade, just jump over it. But keep reading. And you'll almost certainly see, see at least some part of your story there. And it will stretch your mind in all kinds of ways. That's wonderful. I'm actually going to change course now. I'm actually going to do something that might sound weird, but I'd like you to read that passage again. Read the passage again. Uh, and that's just the perfect way to let us go out. And so wherever our audience is listening to this, it's worthy of hearing it again. They're not going to be able to go and jump right into the book and find it. So I think it's worth you reading it one more time. Could be. I'm sorry. It's good to find it. Should have had you earmarked Here it last is, time. About it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, let it rip, Paul. Here we go. This will take us out. Too late have I come to love you, beauty so ancient, so new. Yes, too late have I come to love you. You were within me, yet I was looking for you outside myself. I and my ugliness rushed headlong into the things of beauty you had made. You were with me, but I was not with you. The things you had created kept me far from you. Yet if they had not been in you, they would not have been at all. You called to me and cried aloud and you broke through my deafness. You flashed and shone and chased away my blindness. You breathed upon me fragrantly. I drew in my breath and now I pant for you. I tasted and now I hunger and thirst for you. You touched me, and I burned to enjoy your peace. This has been an episode of The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction. To follow the show, learn about more inspiring holy men and women, and to get special offers exclusive to Spiritual Masters listeners, sign up at spiritualmasterspodcast.com. And thanks for listening.